give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word, and he healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Would you please stand with us this morning as we sing songs of joy, praising our wonderful God.
invite you to, to stand and we're going to enter into a, a time of prayer. And uh, during this time, we'll, we'll pray for our veterans um, as well as the other prayer requests that are on our, our papers and on our hearts this morning. Thank you. Uh, pray with you. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> uh, we gather together this morning, um, not out of habit or not because there's nothing better to do, uh, but because we are a gathered people. You are a God that goes into the world and, and, and finds and calls children to yourself. And you gather us together and form a, a family. And you call us church. And you give us a mission and a purpose of making disciples and reaching others with the good news of your grace and your love and your mercy. On this Veterans Day, we think of uh, those who have served, those who made commitments to put their lives in second place for love of neighbor, for love of country. They have served in various capacities. They have uh, stepped into the unknown, giving control of their lives to wherever needs may call them. And so we thank you this morning for your grace and your mercy that you poured out on them as they served and as you continue to pour grace and mercy into their lives, we appreciate those who are selfless, those who make sacrifice. And so may their uh, witness, their testimony about selfless love of neighbor be an example for us in whatever capacity that we are living in and whatever we are called to be in to do. May we see that our lives are lives of service lives putting others first. Father, there's many burdens and concerns on, on our hearts today. Health concerns, financial concerns, um, concerns in our families and in our nation and around the world. And Father, as we sang a few moments ago, there really is nothing impossible for you. And so the, the matter of the fact is that we're, we're not here trying to convince you to be a good and loving God, but we're, we're, we're praying because we want our lives to be shaped by how good and loving you are. That that, that expectation, that acknowledgement of who you are, creates hope in us. That we put our hope and our trust in you and in nothing else. Father, be with us this morning as we sing praises to you as we worship you, as we hear from your word, and as we <coughs> are gathered as the community of believers, as we gather in faithful obedience to what you call us to be in you. Father, we thank you, everybody. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. This week's scripture reading comes from Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work at those, in those who are disobedient. All of us have lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus Christ in, Jesus Christ, in order that in the coming of ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do works in which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Almost, almost to the, the point of wrapping up our What's a Church to Do sermon series. Um, this is week number eight, I believe, if my math is correct. Um, 
of asking how does the church respond to the world that we find ourselves in? How do we address and, and, and uh, live, honestly, just live as God has called us to live as individuals, but as a community of believers as well in the, in the world that we find ourselves in? Um, this week we're going to look <clears throat> we're going to look at hope and the things that we put our hope in. Um, and, and as we look at hope, um, I mean, hope is kind of one of these religious type words, right? Like we church people love to use the word hope, but the rest of the world uses hope too. Non Christians, you know, non believers, they use the word hope as well. And so, we're, it, hope isn't something that we have, uh, you know, a monopoly on. Yet. What we hope in um, is distinctive from what the world's hope is. And that's what I want, to, want us to look at this morning, is, is, is what we put our hope in. Because what we hope in is what we trust. And what we trust causes us to act a particular way. Right? Our behavior is tied to what we believe, which is tied to what we hope <coughs> Um, have you ever found that you've put all your hope in something only to be disappointed or hurt? Whether it be a small thing or a big thing, you, you put your hope in something and it didn't work out that way. Like you were thinking there's this one thing that you needed to happen to be alright. This situation would be fixed if this one thing or this one person or this one whatever. And, and, and instead, it didn't happen. We identify what we think is the solution to our problems. We identify what we, we think we need and we put our hope in that thing. It seems like so many of our conversations lately, many of the ones I've, I've been having personally, have had this silver bullet mentality kind of underlying it. You guys know I'm talking about silver bullets, not talking about hunting werewolves. Um, but silver bullet in terms of, there's this magic thing that if this one thing would happen, the whole world would just fall into place. Do you remember being a kid and thinking about how all your problems would go away when you became an adult? <laughs> you remember thinking that? Being a, a frustrated teenager going, oh, when I'm an adult and get my own house and I'm on my own, then, then all these problems will go away. <laughs> or you remember being single and thinking that being married would solve all your problems? <laughs> We all have hopes and things that we believe would make our lives better. If I could make a little more money or just have a little bit better job, life would be alright. If my health situation was just a little bit different, or if I had the right friends, or um, if my kids had the right coach or the right teacher, right? If, if I was part of the right relationships, Things used to be used to be better, maybe, and if we could just get back to the way that was, and my hope is in trying to get back to the way things were, or things uh, used to be terrible, and so right now I just hope to get as far away from the past reality as I can, and just get as far away from that as possible. If this whole COVID coronavirus thing would just go away, everything else would be great. <laughs> I find myself thinking about pretty much every day. Um, Maybe we find ourselves thinking if the government did what it's supposed to do, and that's whatever we believe that to be, but if the government did what it's supposed to, to do, then life would be pretty good. We put all our hopes, we, we all have this tendency to put our hopes in the things that we believe would fix our problems and make life better, make life more comfortable, or bring peace to areas of our lives where there's anxiety or conflict. And the, the present circumstances that we find ourselves in, like if you watch the evening news or scroll through social media, look around the internet for whatever reason, um, it, it might find, it might feel like what we're going through is unique to our circumstances, right? Like it's unique to our time. Like the world has never ever seen anything like this before. But the truth is that people have been putting hope into things that could let them down or lead them astray for a long time. As long as people have existed, people have put their hope in the wrong things. People have been hurt and disappointed by what they hoped for. And so our story this morning, and I, I, I've said it a few times as I've preached, um, that I love a good story. And so I, I appreciate the, the Bible in the sense that like it teaches us truth and there's rules to live by and all this type of thing. And I'm not trying to discount any of that. 
But the Bible for me comes to life when I see the story behind it. Right? Like I can read a verse and go, oh, that's a really good verse. But when you look at it, sometimes it takes chapters for stories to unfold. Sometimes it's an entire book you have to read to get the big picture. Right? And so this morning we're going to look at, at a big story. The story begins with a man named King Ahaz. Um, he's not one of the most famous, popular kings. You know, you're not going to find the King Ahaz devotional Bible or anything like that. Um, and for a good reason. Uh, but he was the king of the southern kingdom of Judah about 700 years before Jesus. So if you're not familiar with Israel's history all that well or if you needed a refresher, at one point Israel was one nation. The 12 tribes lived there. Were. And then at one point there was a fight over who was going to be king, who was going to rule this land. And it created a faction in the north and the south broke apart. And so there was Israel to the north and Judah to the south. right? And so they had separate kings and they became totally separate religious uh, communities because Jerusalem and the temple was in the south. So the north had to come up with their own way of worshiping God. And so their trajectories went in, in separate ways. And so our story today is about King Ahaz, who was king of the southern kingdom. <coughs> and to give a little bit of context, um, the prophet Isaiah was contemporary. He, he lived about the same time as Ahaz did. Right? So even though the stories of Ahaz are found in the, the book, the Chronicles, which is more towards the beginning of your Bible, um, and the book of Isaiah is more towards the middle, um, those, those two stories overlap. It's happening around the same time. Ahaz was 20 years old when he uh, became king. He succeeded his father Jotham and took the throne of Judea. Uh, Ahaz was a weak and idolatrous king, though. He submitted himself and his family to pagan worship practices. Um, soon after he became king, remember, he's 20 years old, he's taking the throne after his father, and soon after he becomes his king, he found himself in a ton of trouble. It's like a lot of trouble. Um, the country of Edom, filled with people they called Edomites, revolted. And so there was, there was pressure um, coming from this, this other army, this other country. Um, they even made a successful invasion of Judah, and they took several uh, communities captive and, and hauled them out. They took them as prisoners. And so you've got Edom, not a major threat, but a serious threat to Ahaz. Then the Philistines, who were neighbors, uh, annex some of Judah's land and claimed it as their own territory. So he's dealing with the Edomites, and now he's got the Philistines that are basically just claiming his land. And then finally, there was uh, a, a king named Rezin, who was the king of Syria, who joined forces with the king of Israel. To, they formed a team, and they're, now they're attacking Judah. So he's kind of fighting this battle on three fronts. Um, all enemies, these enemies on all sides. And he has, has been suffering defeat after defeat. His people are scared. He doesn't know what to do. Many people of Judea were being killed. Numerous prisoners were, were being taken. And if you're king, that's not really good for your reputation. Not good for your rule. If your country is being defeated by multiple enemies. And so part of what happened that really kind of tipped the scales, that really kind of pushed Ahaz to make some poor decisions, was that Syria and their king captured an important harbor. Um, Israel, if you look at a, a globe or a map, you'll see it's in a strategic place between some of the large empires of the day and the Mediterranean Sea. And there's some serious waterways that would lead to the rest of the world. And so Israel was a prime uh, location in terms of uh, trading and the economy back in the day. And so Syria conquers and takes this, this port in Elath and took all the, the Jewish people out of there. Exiled, took them all out of there, and then imported Syrian people and set them up in homes there. And basically said, this is Syria now. Ahaz found himself hard-pressed by this team of Israel and Syria, again, that team working together really made things difficult. And, and even his, his city of Jerusalem that he ruled from now seems to be under threat. 
The prophet Isaiah came, comes into the picture and he tries to tell King Ahaz how to proceed. And again, as a prophet, his, his goal isn't about raising armies or um, you know, building more weapons. He says, God will save the city from the hands of the enemy. He says, put your hope in God. Put your trust in God. <coughs> God will save you. That was what the prophet told him. Just put your hope in God. But Ahaz didn't put his hope in God. He didn't put his trust in God. He actually sent a group of his leaders to a, a man named Tiglath Pileser, that's a mouthful, who was the king of Assyria. Assyria was kind of the, the big powerhouse in the neighborhood. Like these other ones that were invading him were. Were, they were bigger than Judah was. But Assyria was, was the true empire in the neighborhood. And so Ahaz sends a, a, a delegation with gold and silver and wealth taken from the temple and sends it to the king of Assyria with instructions to say this, I am your servant and son, save me from the hands of the kings of Assyria and Israel who have gone to war against me. And so just to quick recap, to make sure we're all on the same page, Israel and Syria are attacking Judah, which is ruled by Ahaz in the city of Jerusalem. And Ahaz reaches out to the biggest power, the strongest empire that was nearby, and says, here is some of our wealth from our temple. These are gifts for you. Come help us. We can't do this on our own. You are the power, you are the strong ones, you are the great military in the area. Take our treasure and in turn come save us. But this didn't play out how Ahaz was hoping it would. Tiglath Pileser was, was more than happy to take the treasure. But he was also more than happy to take the opportunity to conquer Syria and Israel. Like this was a great opportunity for him to move against some of his enemies. He marched to Damascus, which is the capital of Syria, and he forced Syria to quit attacking Jerusalem. Uh, the king of Syria, this guy named Rezin, was captured and he was actually killed by the Assyrians. And at that point, Syria was absorbed, it was incorporated, it was conquered by Assyria, and Tiglath Pileser also annexed part of the land of Israel. So it's kind of looking like this might work out for King Ahaz. He appealed to this great power, and this great power comes in and just steamrolls his enemy. You know, Syria is defeated, Israel is defeated. So when he was faced with great trouble, Ahaz put his hope in Assyria, the mighty empire, and it, it appeared to be working. This looks like this might have worked, despite what Isaiah said. Judah's enemies are not defeated. And so, delivered from his enemies, King Ahaz travels to Damascus to, to give thanks to Tiglath Pileser, the king of Assyria. But when he got there, he was informed of some more details to the deal. He was made aware of his status of dependence now upon Assyria and the king. No, he didn't lose to Syria and he didn't lose to Israel, but Judah was now a servant state of this great and powerful empire of Assyria. He hadn't lost in battle, but he had surrendered his authority to rule as he reached out for help. But he continues to make poor decisions after that. So not only has he, in essence, signed his country up to serve another country, while in Damascus he saw this famous pagan altar that was to, to worship one of their gods. And he admired it so much, he thought it was such a wonderful thing to see, that he sent instructions to have it copied and sent back to the high priest Uriah and put in the holy temple in Jerusalem. <coughs> and so he returned from Damascus. He went to this new pagan altar now set up in the holy temple. And he worshipped there. And he forced the priests to offer the daily sacrifices on this pagan altar. 
But it gets worse from there. In order to satisfy the greed of Tiglath Pileser, his new master, Ahaz had to continually raid the temple treasury to try and satisfy the power grab of Tiglath Pileser. He had to continually send him gold and silver in order to maintain this, this awkward and vulnerable position as a servant. So Ahaz robbed the temple of its treasures and wealth that had been built up by previous kings. And so to summarize the story to this point, Ahaz put his hope in a power-hungry, idolatrous empire, and he found himself and his people being ruled and robbed by that same empire that they turned to for help. The people of God and the resources of God had now that, that God had given them were now in the service of a brutal pagan empire. Both politically and spiritually, Ahaz had been instrumental in undermining the foundations of the kingdom of Judea. Because he put his hope in this, this, this empire, this powerful neighbor, the very foundations of his own kingdom started to unravel. And then he died. Again, this is why I said he doesn't have a devotional Bible. This is not an inspirational story. Ahaz died, and his son Hezekiah becomes. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king. And the Bible picks up the story of Hezekiah's reign by starting with this phrase. It says, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Father not meaning biological father, right? But ancestor, teacher, um, one you follow. Right? So Hezekiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple and repaired them. Early on in his new reign, he said, we've got to get back to who we are as God's people. And so he opened the doors of the temple and began to work on them. And this is what the scriptures tell us that Hezekiah said. It says, consecrate yourselves now and consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all the defilement from the sanctuary. The priests then went into the sanctuary of the Lord to purify it. They brought out to the courtyard of the Lord's temple everything unclean that they found in the temple of the Lord. The Levites took it and carried it out to the Kidron Valley. They began the consecration on the first day of the first month, and by the eighth day of the month, they reached the portico of the Lord. Uh, the portico of the Lord is a specific place inside the temple. And so they were doing spring cleaning, basically, cleaning out all the unclean, idolatrous stuff, and for eight days, they cleaned and they got to the, the portico of the Lord, which is basically like a porch. So if you're familiar with the layout of the temple, it's like concentric circles, and the, the more you get towards the center, the more you get to the holy place. Well, the portico of the Lord is kind of halfway. So after eight days of removing pagan and unclean things, they're about halfway through. Ahaz had really made a mess of this place. And so for eight more days, they consecrated the temple of the Lord, finishing on the 16th day of the first month. Once the temple was cleaned up, the priests and the kings offered sacrifices for the sins of their ancestors. Right, now that they have the temple back, now they can go back and, and approach God and take care of the sins and the uncleanliness that has been allowed to happen under King Ahaz. And the Bible says it was a large sacrifice, meaning there was a lot of sin, a lot of sin that needed to be dealt with. And once it was complete, regular worship and sacrifice continued in the temple. So not only did they clean it up and do the sacrifice once, but now they kind of started having regular church services again. The temple was purified and proper worship was restored amongst the priests and the king. Then Hezekiah instructed that Passover be celebrated. This is something they hadn't done during the reign of Ahaz at all. They hadn't celebrated the Passover, which is hard to imagine because it was core to who they were as Jewish people. And so people came from all over to celebrate this Passover. 
Most of the people had been a little, uh, living according to the Jewish laws. Again, the temple wasn't functioning. They couldn't offer sacrifices like they were supposed to. And so most of these people who came to Passover were deemed unclean. So the priests had to do a ton of extra sacrifices to try and get the people ready to participate in the Passover. They did this purifying work so that these people could come worship with them. And then the Bible tells us, and I love this, that the king prayed to God for those who were unclean to be accepted by God. What an image of a king who is also a priest. A king who stands before his people and says, God, forgive their sins. They're not worthy, but they're here to worship. And the Bible says that God heard Hezekiah's prayers and the people were healed and the people were restored. This Passover lasted seven days. And those were the seven days it was prescribed. And people were confessing their sins. They were confessing their idolatry. They were celebrating the grace and goodness of God. They were talking about the Passover, God freeing them, of defeating their enemies, and removing idolatry and sin from, from the people. And after those seven days, it says the whole of the gathered group decided to celebrate for another seven days. So the king had called a party for seven days. And after those seven days, the people said, this is great. We're not ready to go home yet. Let's do another seven days. Uh, the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 30 ends by saying, The entire assembly of Judah rejoiced, along with the priests and the Levites, and all who had assembled from Israel, including the foreigners who had come from Israel, and also those who resided in Judah. So not only was it the, the people that lived in Judah, but people that lived in Israel heard about Passover, like, we've got to get to the temple. So it broke through those boundary lines as well. The scripture continues and says, There was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there has been nothing like this in Jerusalem. The priests and the Levites stood to bless the people, and God heard them, and their prayer reached heaven. His holy throne place. And that's how chapter 30 of 2 Chronicles ends. And, and, and now we've gotten, <laughs> we've gotten to the scripture for today. That was all the introduction. <laughs> the scripture for today is only one verse. In 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 1. And it picks up right where the story that I was telling ends up. It says, When all of this had ended, the celebrations, the feasts, the sacrifices, the Passover. When all of this had ended, the Israelites who were there went out to the towns of Judah. They smashed the sacred stones and they cut down the Asherah's poles. They destroyed the high places and altars throughout Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh. And then they, after they had destroyed the ball, the Israelites returned to their own towns, to their own property. High places and altars are, were the places where foreign gods were worshipped. It was the gathered place to practice idol worship. And in these places, there would have been the idols themselves. Figures and statues and, and, and things that were carved from wood and, and cast out of various metals. There would have been these idols themselves, images of these pagan gods. And so I want you to see this story. Like there's awesome moments in the story that happened, and they're great to celebrate individual moments, but I want you to see the big picture of what happened here. After the temple was purified, after the priests were consecrated and dedicated to the work of God, the people of God worshipped joyfully for that prescribed week and found it to be such an amazing, wonderful experience that they wanted to continue to worship the one true God. Right? And then, they were enjoying worshiping the one true God so much that when they left the gathering, they went out into the world, they went out into their communities, and tore down the idols that had led them astray. They tore down the places where idols were worshipped. They, they tore down the places in their community that weren't the true God's temple. And that's the message today. 
when we, like King Ahaz, find ourselves in a tough spot, or maybe feeling uh, dissatisfied, maybe uncomfortable with the way things are, we put our hopes in things. We put our hopes in the things around us that, that look like they might have the power of God. They look like they might have the answer. They look like they'll bring us the life we are searching for. It's easy to put our hope and trust in these present-day idols. Just name a few. Money, comfort, popularity, political affiliation, tradition, power, pleasure, success, control, friendships, relationships, achievement, social, family networks, education, status, on and on. We are tempted to see our hopes to put our hopes in those things. They look like they have the power to meet our needs. They look like they're the things that are going to lead us to freedom, to health, to wholeness, to hope. Right? Ahaz looks at, at tiglath pileser this ruthless king, and says, that's where my hope lies. But it brought death in my life. And we're tempted to make that same poor choice when we see these things that look like they carry the power of God, that look like they have the answers we're searching for, and we put our hopes in them, we give them the highest place in our lives, and we worship at their altars, and we say, once I have fill in the blank, then everything will be all right. But that story of Hezekiah's Passover is so important because it reminds us that once we worship the real God, once we have an experience, an encounter with the true God, the living God, we enter into a posture of worship before that God, the one that is revealed through Jesus in the Bible. If we experience moments of true relationship with God, then we, like those people at Passover, realize there's no other place we'd want to be. There's no other God we'd rather serve. When compared with the living God, the hopes and promises of these other idols are empty and void. We don't need these high places all around. These are these aren't God. We've, we've experienced the real things. Everything else is a fraud. When compared with the living God, the hopes and promises of these other idols are empty and void. And there's no peace in worshiping an idol. The Bible tells us that idol worship leads to death and destruction. It, it tells us that the altars that were taken from the temple. The scripture that I, I referred to, it said they were taken from the temple to the Kidron Valley. Now to many of us, the Kidron Valley is just a, whatever, it's a spot on a map, right? Not a big deal. Might mean nothing to us today. But the Kidron Valley, back in those days, was the home of the most famous cemetery in that area. The idols were taken to the cemetery because they're dead things. They worshipped a living God and had no patience, no room, no need for these dead idols. And so this is <clears throat> the truth for us today. We'll put it on the screen. That experiencing the living God reveals that the idols we are tempted to put our hopes in will not lead us to life. I love the fact that it was worship, that it was commitment, consecration. They said they consecrated themselves and the temple. That's commitment to God. And in worship, they found relationship with the one true God. We won't find peace and joy at the altar of idols. So as Christians, as God's people today, let's commit to put our hope and our trust in the one true God. The living God. And not be distracted or fall into having faith in the idols of this world. Let us consecrate ourselves. Let us repent. Let us be cleansed and worship the living God. And after encountering the true God, the God of love, the God of forgiveness, the, the God of justice, the God of grace, of mercy, it becomes crystal clear that so many of the things that we're tempted to put our hopes into are idols that lead us away from God. Like King Ahaz and Judah, we end up serving the wrong God. We end up committing ourselves to the service of the wrong God. We end up putting our energies and our resources into the wrong God. And if you want to know how to tell what an idol is versus what a, the one true God is, we Christians believe that Jesus 
is the most perfect picture of who God is. Right? So seeing Jesus is seeing God the Father. Jesus' own words say that. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So if you are worshiping or trusting in something that doesn't look like Jesus, that isn't like Jesus, there's a good chance that your trust is going towards an idol. So church, let us focus on Jesus. Let's get to know Jesus. Let's study his life, his teachings, his ministry, right? In those things, Jesus perfectly reveals to us his Father. All other pictures of God lead us towards idols which will leave us hurt, broken, disappointed. And that's why as Christians, there's a lot of things we can focus our time and energy on. And, and they're good things. But as a church, we're entering into a season where we focus our, our narrow, you know, bring the focus in super tight on Jesus. In a few weeks, we'll begin the season of Advent in which we start hoping and expecting and waiting for this, this Jesus to show up. And so we, we join with people from long ago in placing our hope in this Jesus. And then at Christmas, we celebrate his arrival. We celebrate the beginning of his life and the beginning of his ministry and how he fulfills the promises of God to God's people. After Christmas, we enter into a season of epiphany in which God is revealed to us through the revelation of who Jesus is. During the season of Epiphany, we get to know who Jesus is. We enter into the season of Lent after that, in which we ask, what does it mean to follow this Jesus? What does it cost? What does it look like? What are the challenges of committing your life to this man, Jesus? And then after Lent is the season of Easter, where we follow him to his death and we follow him to new life. But for the next several months, church, our vision is going to be on Jesus. And as we experience Jesus personally and deeply, I believe that like Hezekiah's Passover reveals, that when we worship and we get to know the real Jesus, Anything that the world has to offer is just going to look like dead things. If you've experienced the love and grace and forgiveness of Jesus, then anything the world has to offer is going to pale in comparison. So let us put our hope, let us put our trust, not in things of this world, but in Jesus, in God who is revealed in him. You can invite the worship team to come. And lead us in a, a moment of, of worship and response and prayer. Um, pray with me, people. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your, your word that tells us this story from long ago. Of, of your people who had lost their way. Out of fear and vulnerability, their king led them to trust and hope in idols, to trust and hope in power that didn't come from you, to trust and hope in things of the world and not things of God. And in his reign, things got way off track. The temple, your holy place, was so filled with things not from you that it took weeks to get it cleaned up. Your people were so far from you that it took uh, amazing sacrifices just to get sin dealt with again and forgiveness to be proclaimed to the people. Your people were so far from relationship with you that they didn't even realize what they were missing. But once all the consecrating was done, once the spring cleaning had been done, once all the hard work of of clearing out the temple and, and all that was done, they got a taste. They got a taste of what relationship with you was. They celebrated the feast of Passover, and for seven days they experienced the joy, 
that they didn't even remember that they could have. They experienced a peace that they didn't realize was available to them. And so after seven days, Lord, they said, we haven't had enough of you yet. So they, they wanted seven more days. Father, make our souls hunger for you in such a way that when we see your grace in our lives, when we see how you are working in us and we experience true relationship with you, that, that it draws us closer to you. It creates a hunger, a desire for us to know you more. And your people, once they got to know you, Lord, they had no room for these idols anymore. Father, may that story from so long ago, nearly 3,000 years ago, may that story be our story today. That we have an encounter with the living God so real and so powerful that the, the idols of this world appear as dead things. We have no desire for anything but you. Father, may your spirit move in us and create that. May we hear your voice calling us your children. We thank you, and we love you. Amen. Today I want to send you out with a blessing that comes from, from Scripture, from the book of Romans. Chapter 15, verse 13 is the, the source of this blessing, the source of this benediction. So I, I pray that you would receive this. And as we go, we go as ones who are sent by God. Hear this word this morning. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 And a blessing to be with you. Christmas.